Father, this morning, we thank you for the privilege that we have to open this word without fear of death or imprisonment. Lord, the privilege that it is to be able to carry this book wherever we want to go and whenever we want to read it and to proclaim the words within its pages. Lord, we love you for it. We thank you for it. But Lord, let the pages come alive today. Let the words jump off this book. And Father, that they might come to us in a way that strengthen us but Lord, that might carry us through the next situation. That might be what we need to face, what is coming next. That Lord will be able to defeat the enemy in every aspect that he comes at us. And Lord, we know he's out to seek and to destroy us. But Lord, we know that our fate, our, our destiny is in you. And so Lord, we're grateful for that this morning. Lord, speak to us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we want to look this morning at the, the enemy of apathy. Uh, the enemy of apathy. And when we talk about apathy, we're talking about a lack of passion, um, a lack of excitement. Uh, there's just sort of like the blah. When you think of blah, I, I think of certain things I don't like to do, like math. I, I'm apathetic to math. I don't like the word. In fact, I worked all morning on saying the word because normally I choke on the word math. It's just something I don't like. I know it's necessary. And in order to sustain life, you have to utilize math. It's funny, I don't do a lot of it. In fact, when we when the kids are in school, especially now with Elsa, it, there's all kinds of new math. I mean, what's with that? What was wrong with the old math? You know, adding and subtracting, leave it at that. Why do you have to do more? But now they added letters to it, and I just don't care. You know, I think if you're going to blend English with math, you, you've missed something, and I just don't think that they should be together. So do I have any amens from those still in school? They're all quiet. Amen. There you go. So anyway, I, I know there's things that we become almost, almost conditioned to, and yet there's the, the, the attitude or the approach of apathy. So in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, it says this, I know your works that you are neither hot, cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot so that, when you be, when, so that because you are then lukewarm, you're neither cold nor hot. I will vomit you out of my mouth. So when we talk about apathy, we're talking about a lack of passion, and we're talking about being lukewarm. Now, I, I, how many have ever had to, you know, take lukewarm water? And I mean, this is awful. I, I, I don't like coffee lukewarm. Now, I can drink it cold, and I can drink it, drink it hot. But it, in that in-between stage, it's sort of like, blah. That's what God's referring to, this, this apathy, this lack of passion when it comes to the church. There, there should be a genuine excitement in every believer's life that we have something that others don't have. When we have come into a, a, a relationship with Jesus Christ, we're now in a position or a posture of receiving things from God that we don't necessarily deserve. There's nothing we can do that merits anything that God does for us. And yet we are, we've just become so conditioned to it. In fact, to the point that we, we sometimes can come, I'm going to say this, probably offend everybody in the room, that's okay. We'll come through the doors of the church with an expectation of what is going to happen to the point that we're so conditioned, well, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. We're going to, we're going to stand up here, we're going to sit down here. We're going to sing this song, we're going to say this verse. There's such a routine that we become almost conditioned that it becomes just so lacking the connection to it. You know, I prayed this morning the privilege that we have to carry this book around. The privilege that we have to own this book. And many of us probably have more than, a co more than one copy at home. So if I were to do a poll this morning, I would say, how, if you have more than one Bible, would you raise your hand? So go ahead, raise your hand if you have more than one copy of the Bible at home. Amen. How many have more than five copies of the Bible at home? Yeah. Now, I, I could go on all morning, Okay. I have 16 different Bibles downstairs in my study, okay? Now, you're saying, well, how many? Well, why, why do you need so many? Well, some of them are falling apart, and I just, I don't know what to do with an old Bible, but put it on the shelf, right? So you have these things, and, and they're precious, and they're just full of the same information that's in this book. Why would I keep it? Because I recognize that this is God's Word, and the privilege, this is just one aspect of our journey. The privilege and the joy that it is to have this book in my possession is something we as Americans have gotten almost lazy about. 
you know, there's something to be said about the Word of God. But that's just, again, one aspect of our journey. How about the, the power of prayer? How many have ever had an answer to prayer? Anybody? Amen. I, I mean, we've experienced that. That's huge. That, that's not a little thing. When we connect to the Father and we say, I need, you got to get me out of this. You got to help me through this. You're going to help me face this. And it may not be exactly what we pray, but God brings us through and answers us. Man, we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that there is a God. He's real and he heard me and he moved me. That ought to excite us. And yet we get to a point in our Christian journey that we just sort of go through these motions and there's no joy. There's no connection to the Creator. I'm still in awe many times when I get on my face before God and I realize that I have an audience with the guy that put this world into motion, that breathed life into our bodies, and I'm now talking to him because i got to tell you, he's more famous than anybody I'd ever imagine. And yet we can just go through life without any passion. Be so, and, and, and Jesus said, I'd rather you be cold. Just, just be completely turned off. Just let go of it. Don't play this half and half. See, the real enemy we're fighting is sort of within ourselves again. We talked about these before. They're within us. They're, they're behaviors that are common to the old man. Paul says, daily I need to crucify my old self. The old man, I got to get rid of him. Every single day he pops his ugly head up to remind me he, who he was and what he was capable of doing, and I've got to get rid of that. I've got to crucify him. And there are some days where I, I, I'm just going to be, you're going to think I'm a little twisted, but there are days I enjoy nailing that, that guy to a cross because there are days where I can't stand what he tries to do. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the ways that I used to live before I knew Christ. When I surrendered to Jesus Christ, I became a new creature in Christ. And that means that I have experienced real joy, real release. And comes with that, man, it's not just this apathetic way of approaching God. Well, you know, I, I think he's real. I hope he's real. We, we know God really well when we're in trouble, don't we? Man, do we know him. We get really excited when, when, when we know we've got a big problem and we've got a real God that can answer that prayer. But where is God when we're going through, you know, everything smooth sailing? I got my car fixed this last week, had to get the brakes done. I'm terrible on brakes, by the way. It's better here than Charleroi. Charleroi, everything is sort of uphill. So coming down means you apply the brakes quite a bit. So anyway, I got the brakes fixed. And here I got in there and my mechanic said, your starter was bad, it's a brand new starter. I went, why? He said, well, sometimes these things just don't work. I, okay, so uh, it was under warranty and he switched it out. We drove all over the place yesterday, pulled in my mother's driveway this morning and it wouldn't start. I'm like, I got to go to work, Lord. You're going to have to start this car. Or we're going to have to start walking. And it didn't just click over and do a click, click. It ran and it was spinning and it sounded like it was going to explode. It was awful. I'm not a mechanic. So the idea of what is wrong, I have no idea. I opened the hood like that was going to help. Have you ever done that? You look, grabbed a wire or two. I, I don't even, I know it's an engine. I know what it's meant to do. I became passionate about having to be in church, but yet we can allow all of these things to get in the way, can't we? To the point that we have just lost our joy. You know, Paul was writing to us in the Philippian verses here it, that we read that we haven't arrived there. I haven't achieved it yet. It's still something I'm working at. So at the risk of sounding like I'm browbeating any of us, it is the fact that we are still working in these areas of our life. Some days we're going to be really passionate about things. And I was passionate this morning when I was praying, Lord, you got to start this car. I took the key out. The engine's still, that little motor's still running. I thought, how does that even work? That doesn't make any sense. And so I'm standing, because I want to be the good husband, 
I'm, I'm not mechanical. She knows that. So it's a complete farce. And I'm holding the hood. And I'm going, Lord, you've got to start this car. I've got to look good. And he reminded me that when things are going smoothly, I need to be as passionate in my prayer. I shouldn't just be crying out to God because things went bad. I have to cry out to God because things are good. Because he answered prayer. Because I had a day with no major catastrophes. It was a good day. This whole approach to it comes down to how it affects us in the church and what it does to us. Apathy can destroy us. It can. It can destroy us. It causes us to be lukewarm about our fellowship, the church. It causes us to be lukewarm about being here, being invested in what God's doing here, what our function and our purpose is. A lot of times, I know I've said this many times, and I'll continue to say it until Jesus comes. There are times we come through the doors of this church because we think this is something that I get to do. I check off my attendance. I've been in church. God, you'll be good to me this week. And of course, that's not how that works. This is a function of the church, and this is a necessary process. It's where the body of believers come together to empower one another, to pray together, to worship God. But it's also a place where we receive healing and forgiveness and the connection to God. It's a place where we become empowered by the word. But if apathy is the enemy I'm losing to, then coming to church is just going to be a step. It's not really anything important. It also causes us to be lukewarm about reaching the lost. How we approach evangelism in any fashion or form. Well, pastor, you know, I'm really not called to be in the mission field. I'm really not one of those people. That's not my, I love that. That's not my ministry. Do you know that that is your ministry as a believer in Jesus Christ? You go to the end of the Gospels and you'll see there that he charges all of us to go everywhere we can to preach the gospel. In fact, Jesus even said it to the disciples and it didn't limit it to there because he included it in scripture, which means it's now part of our charge that we'll receive the power after we receive the Holy Spirit that we will be his witnesses wherever we go. Now, we may not be the people that travel overseas or go here or there or different places in the world in, in an evangelistic approach to things, but everywhere we walk, live, and breathe, and exist, we are to be a representative ambassador for Jesus Christ. So no matter where we are, we're on mission for Christ. But if I'm lukewarm, I'm really not going to be very good at it. I'm going to sort of look at it like, well, somebody else will talk to them about Christ. Have you often wondered, maybe you haven't, and I'll spark some thought today. Have you often wondered how many people that you've walked past in a day and whether any of them know the Lord and that you just walked past an opportunity to share Christ and you might have been the one instance that that one person might have surrendered to Jesus? Have you ever considered that? And if that person came to Christ and how God used that person to later then lead someone else to Christ and someone else to... Do you see the ripple effect? It, it's enormous. It's enormous. So every time I don't bother to think about my charge or my calling, how many people have had to pass from me to someone else to come to Christ and how much of their life has been wasted without Christ. It causes us to be lukewarm about righteousness. I love the word righteousness. It tends to be a lofty word, one that we think is unachievable, but yet it's the rightness of God. The word righteousness just means that, the rightness of God. It causes us to be lukewarm about doing the right things. Doing the right things. Elsa's getting to the age where she's going to be driving soon. Have mercy on my soul. She's probably a better driver than most at 15. And I, before you all worry and call the police on me, and don't call Dave, um, 
We drive in the parking lot at the high school. She does really well. She drives my big car. It's huge. And I said, if you can drive this monster, you can drive anything. Okay? She gets out there. She does a really good job. So now that she's learning all of these things, we're at a stoplight, and I don't have my blinker on. She said, Dad, you know you're supposed to turn your blinker on. Nobody was behind me. Nobody's in front of me. Nobody cares. That's the rule. That's the rule. Dad, you're not wearing a seatbelt. Oh, I'm just, I'm just getting out over here. You, you realize? I won't talk about the rest of them because then you're just going to think terrible thoughts of me. It causes us to be lukewarm about doing the right things. Sometimes the right things are simple things. Don't get me wrong. We, we need to be careful about the big things too. But we're the ones that have given them classification. In fact, you know that we, the, we're, the only, we're the only creatures on the earth that actually sort of categorize and differentiate between bad sins and good sins. I don't know what the thing, where we ever got the thought of being a good sin. I mean, where is that at? Sin is sin, the Bible says. Sin is absolute sin. doesn't matter what it is. If I've murdered somebody, it's the same as if I've lied. But we want to lessen the lie one because we figure, well, that's not so bad. That's not so bad. Sin is sin. The rightness of God is the rightness of God. We don't need to be lukewarm to that. We need to be passionate about doing the right things, honoring God in those things. We also It also causes us to be lukewarm about practicing the fruits of the Spirit. Y'all know what those are. My favorite and my least favorite is the same one. It's called long-suffering. And there's a reason King James put it in that way, long and suffering. It's patience. We don't ever want to, we don't want to suffer long. To be patient with him, be patient with one another. How many, does anybody want to confess this morning who's impatient? Nobody wants to. I got a couple hands. Praise God for your boldness. Don't be afraid to own that one. Nobody wants to be just waiting around. I love it when you have a doctor's appointment and you go in and they tell you, don't be late. In fact, be 15 minutes early and you sit there for 45 minutes and you're going, are you kidding me? I, I, I mean, I could have been somewhere out doing something else. So when I get in there, I usually try to take my time. I'm going to get my 45 minutes back. No, could you look at this too? Could you do this? No, I really don't do that. But when we talk about the idea of long-suffering or the fruits of the Spirit, these are things that don't necessarily come naturally. That's why they're called the fruits of the Spirit, meaning that God gives us the ability to go through those things and to utilize them. And they're, they're gifts, if you will. But apathy will cause us to be lukewarm about it. It'll cause us to really not care whether or not I love somebody or I'm patient. We struggle with that. Apathy is an area that every Christian has either been or is, and you'll be again, because things become almost scheduled and routine. I have found that I believe that's why God mixes things up and throws us all kinds of issues. I've often wondered, when I've asked the question, why God, why me? There's a reason is because I've gotten lukewarm about something. I'm not paying attention to something else. Or he just needs my attention. He might just need my attention. The, the last enemy that we deal with is the enemy of sin. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Again, it's, a, it's an idea or a motion moving forward. But the writer of Hebrews tells us that there is a, a great cloud of witness, meaning there's been a lot of other people that have gone before us many of which we read in Scripture, others we've, we've kind of journeyed in life with, people that we've known or read about. There's people that God has used and, and done great and incredible things with. But he says there is a great cloud of witness that we're surrounded by that have seen worse things than we're seeing right now. I got to tell you, there, there's some pretty rough things we've seen in our day. I, I know that. It occurred to me the other day that I've actually been in the room 
with, with, with over seven people that have died while I stood there with them as they pass from one life into the next. It's, it's a weird feeling. I'll just be honest with you. It's not something that I'm super comfortable with. Maybe it's part of the job, but it's just. There have been people that I've watched pass from this life and the journey that they've gone through and the pain that they've dealt with. There's one lady I'll never forget. It was on a Sunday morning. I had actually showed up at the hospital. I want to say it was close to midnight. And the doctor said, it's just going to be a matter of minutes. And so I'm flying up the highway to get there. I will be honest and confess I did not use the speed limit. And as I arrived at the hospital, her daughter and her daughters were there. And I walk into the room and she's not really there. She's not coherent. Of course, her daughters are crying. And I take her hand and we begin to pray. Five and a half hours later, she passes. She struggled. She labored with four different kinds of cancer. And she received her final healing when she entered into the presence of God. Her witness was incredible. Every time she went to the doctors, she'd share her faith and that God was going to bring her through, even if it meant that she would pass on. She was content to go. And she would share the story. She would share her story everywhere she went. And I look at the life of Betty and I think to myself, my life was pretty easy then. And she fought cancer and fought it with a vengeance. Man, she went after it. It never stopped her from teaching children. It never stopped her from singing Sunday morning. And as long as she could physically get to church, she was in church. And she would smile at you and through her pain and not care one bit. The cloud of witness, that's just my story. There's others. Hebrews gives us all of these great uh, members of Scripture that have gone on. We think of Abraham and Moses. Think about Abraham. Oh, my goodness. Think about him. God comes to him and said, listen, <laughs> I'm going to move you, but I'm not going to tell you where you're moving. I mean, how many of us would be up for that? We'd be, I, no, 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 no. I, I, I got to know where we're going. I'm going to move you, and I just want you to pack up. And it was different in his day, by the way. They didn't have U-Haul. They didn't have any rider trucks. They didn't have moving companies. Mayflower didn't show up to move you. They packed it all up on everything they owned, and that included all of their wealth, which was all their animals, and they traveled. He says, I'll take you to a place, and when you get there, I'll let you know you're there. No, we don't do that, do we? We're planners. We have to look ahead. We have to see all the details. What has this got to do with sin? Because what we're dealing with, there are many that have gone before that have failed. And their failures are there as an example and a reminder. One of the great members of faith that we think of is David. He was a man after God's own heart. And yet, we always rem were reminded of his great and hideous failure when he dared to do what he did. He didn't just sin, but he kept sinning and get it, it got worse and worse. First he has an affair, then he lies about it, then he tries to manipulate the situation, so he brings Uriah home, and then he ends up killing him. Man, if, if, if it just snowballed like that all the time, well, we're there. This might be the most obvious enemy we deal with, isn't it? The enemy knows what we like to do that is wrong. He knows what we like to get ourselves caught up in. He knows how to trip us up. He knows what to put in our way to get our attention off of God. And the Bible really teaches us, we've got to remember this, that we cannot lose what God has given to us, but we can definitely get off track. We can definitely begin to look at the wrong things, get our eyes set on the wrong things. Being the most obvious enemy doesn't mean that it's easy. 
Sin happens to people who don't, who just don't know the difference. No, sin happens to everybody. Jokingly, I shared with the kids this morning, I, I was a perfect child. I do want to tell you, I was only hit, I was only punished twice in my life with a spanking. And um, one of those I shared on a Wednesday night that didn't have to happen. I didn't want to wear a pair of pants that were left for me. And no, you're not getting paid today for this one. But I didn't want to wear these pants. They didn't, they didn't fit me right. Now, they were not my favorite, but my favorite pants were not clean. And that was not my failure. That was someone else's. And they didn't get cleaned. And so my father hears the argument between my mother and I over the fact that the pants she suggested don't fit me. So my dad gets up and he comes downstairs to my room and he's standing in the doorway with a belt in his hand. What would you think? I'm about to get beat. I said, come on, let's go. He goes, well, I was brought, I brought this down for you to wear around your waist, but now I'll use it. And he chased me around that room and beat me to, you know, obedience. I didn't need that one. That was the second beating. The first one, I don't remember. I, I think it was abuse, too. I'm, I'm sure it was. I don't think it was warranted. The reason they didn't belt me one on a regular basis is not that I didn't deserve it. It's that I bruised like a Georgia peach. And I looked horrible if I got smacked. Yeah. So they found new ways of manipulating, I mean, um, allowing discipline to be a part of my life. So I know there are those that have gone before me and there are those that will still follow behind me. Will I be one of those accounted with that, that, uh, that people look at and say that there was a great cloud of witness? I don't know. But I do know that ignorance and unbelief and apathy are all issues that we deal with and they're enemies that we deal with. But can I tell you that all three of those lead to sin? They lead us, our our ignorance of not knowing the truth. We We have a copy, we've just admitted that we have more than one at home, that we have a copy of Scripture and yet we don't bother to open it and read it or begin to pray and say, God, let me understand it. Let me learn the right way of doing things. But then we have this unbelief because maybe what we're reading doesn't jive or fit with our thinking. We might have this idea or an agenda or a narrative that that we would rather listen to rather than what God wants us to do. I love to hear when people say, well, that's the King James Version. I can't understand that. Listen, I'm going to tell you the King James is one of the better translations. But if you can't get it on that, go find one that you can. You want to see me after church? I'll direct you to some really good ones. But let me just tell you, don't ever let ignorance be your excuse because it will only lead to sin in the same way that that ignorance will. Unbelief causes us to just, I don't believe this. No, no, I don't believe the scripture says that. Let me tell you something. You can take any, this is dangerous. You can take any passage of scripture and get it to say what you want because that's how the enemy twists things. Don't you remember before you knew the Lord, you were his? All that stuff's there, but then we get to the apathetic approach. I just don't care. Do whatever you're going to do. Do whatever. But they all lead to sin. They lead us to sin. If the church practices sin, how can we remain in the church? If we're going to practice sin, how on earth do we remain in it? Sin's a big deal. I know that we could probably sit and maybe think back to the last week. And I'm sure we've all messed up. I'm sure we have. I guarantee it, because if I did it, you did it. We're all capable of doing it. We prayed for God to forgive us at some point in our journey, correct? when we recognized we needed him as our Lord and our Savior, and we prayed, Lord, forgive me of my sins. It didn't end there. It's not that kind of blanket coverage daily. You know, the Bible says that we're to confess our sins one to another. (gasps) Oh my goodness, I have to share that with people? Sin, if undealt with, Festers. 
and it will grow and it will do damage to the point that we no longer care about God. We ought to be the most excitable people on the planet because of who we know, because of what Jesus has done for us. We deserve the death on a cross. We deserve to be brutalized. We deserved the beating. And yet God, through his love, saw fit to extend a gift to us that we don't deserve. That we would have the opportunity to receive him as Lord and Savior. See, the church moving forward will be halted by the enemies that we do not bother to take time to fight. We've got to take hold of them. We just can't leave it alone. It's not going to go away. I know there's some things that you just think, well, you know, leave well enough alone. It, it'll work itself out. Sin isn't one of those things, folks. Sin is something that has to be dealt with. I, I've often said, that, you know, there's a lot of times that when we do something wrong, we tend to view that something led me to it. Well, if, if they didn't do this, I wouldn't have done that. If this wouldn't happen, then I wouldn't have done this. We're just putting it off. When you make this relationship work between you and God, then everything else in this journey will work itself out. But we have to first and foremost make this right. We have to make things correct with God. And if it's not been dealt with and it's still part of your past, can I just let you know the reason you're not moving forward is because you're still carrying that weight. You're still carrying that mess. We got to get that under the blood. Maybe it's not sin you're dealing with in, the, in itself. Maybe it is apathy. Maybe you just lost your joy about who God is. It's time to start being joyful about what God is doing. Maybe there's just certain things you're just having a hard time believing. Or maybe ignorance is the one. I read in my Bible that we have a, an incredible power in Jesus Christ. The Bible says in the book of Acts that we will receive the power, the ability not just to be a witness, but beyond that, to exist and journey with Christ. That means in the name of Jesus, I can move these things out of my way. I can move ignorance out. I can move unbelief. I can move apathy, and I can move sin. I can. I don't need an elder of the church. I don't need a pastor. I don't need seven missionaries, and I don't need all of this other stuff. I don't need all of that. I have, as a child of God, the power and the ability to pray in the name of Jesus and move it out. That's it. I hope that's not the first time you've ever heard that. I think a lot of Christians walk through life thinking they need so many, so many other steps and some formula to make it work but in the name of Jesus, I can move this out so that I can move to what's next. What is next? To be joyful in the Lord, to be excited about what he's doing, to be ready for whatever change he requires. Because the change in my life is daily. It's not just my plans, it's what is he going to teach me today? What is he going to teach me? Not every, not every day is filled with joy. Sometimes I have to lean on the Lord for that. Not every day is full of worship. Not every day is, I'm going to say it, not every day is full of reading the Bible. Some days I, I, I'm, I can't stop. There's so much happening. There's days where I just need to surrender. 
and say, God, I'm done. I can't do this without you. In the name of Jesus, take what I'm dealing with and defeat this enemy and move him. Now listen to me. That sounds great. That sounds awesome, Pastor. I'm going to do that right now. But listen, that doesn't mean the enemy won't try again. He's going to come at you, and he's going to come at you, and he's going to come at you. Just because we've prayed doesn't mean he stops fighting. Because the end of his story is coming quick. The Bible says there's a day coming when the sky is going to open and God's going to call us home and it's going to be the end of the end of the end. And I'm going to tell you what, man, that is something to get excited about. But until that day, I will be battling and fighting this enemy so I can't let my guard down. I can't move past this. I got to remember what it took to get through this so I can defeat these enemies every time they show up. Just when I think I've won, someone else is going to poke its ugly head up and I'm going to deal with that one now. Whatever it is, God is faithful. God is faithful. And he doesn't leave us. He's always by our side. Let's stand and close in prayer. Lord, Lord, we're here today. And we know these enemies are real. We do. Not only are they real, but they are sometimes hard to fight. Grant us the strength to not only acknowledge the enemy and declare war, but, Father, that we might see it through. Help us to fight the good fight. Help us to press on to the prize that you have before us. Let us remember that we're not the only one fighting this fight, that, Lord, you have sent others ahead and shown ways of dealing with it. Help us, Lord, to focus on you. Be reminded that you've gone before us and you've laid out a way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.